Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters. I've been sturgeon spearing for over 50 years, somewhere around 18, 19 maybe, possibly 20 fish over my lifetime, but uh, it's quite a sport. It's camaraderie and that's what sturgeon spearing is. They spawn every four years and the caviar uh, comes out of what they call black egg fish. Female eggs are caviar, but they have to be black in order to be uh, good to eat. Well, it's caviar, it's a little fishy, but uh, I like it. In limited quantities, you know, you're not going to sit there and eat uh, tablespoons full of it, but with uh, a few crackers in that, uh, it's a great, uh, a great food. This is a show. Congratulations. It's always a big attraction right here. We got fish hanging. It's been a pretty decent day here, at least. I had to carry it, and it, it kind of dripped down on, the, on, my, on my shoulder there. It happens. It's all part of it. It's the best time of the year. I mean, I hunt and fish. I go to Canada every year musky fishing, and but there's something about spearing that you you can't beat. I, I don't know. I, maybe because it's you're on the ice and it's the cold, and I, I don't know. It's hard to explain, and it, it's something very special, unique to this area that I love it. I never miss it. <laughs> Well, I've been out on the lake with my dad spearing surgeons since I was a really small child. You can start spearing when you're 14. So I've been out here every year since then, except for one when I was pregnant with Eleanor, my oldest. I have not caught any yet. I, I don't think I have very good luck. My husband's gotten two, my dad's gotten a lot over the years. They're, they're prehistoric, they're dinosaurs. They live to excess of 150, 200 years old. We're always out here opening day. We'll have a Bloody Mary at nine o'clock or at first fish. So we have heat and we have food and cooking devices in there. And we also have cameras um, that we drop down into the water. So the process is you, you cut a big hole in the ice with the chainsaw, take one of these shanties and you push it over the top of the hole. And in order to get the surgeon to come in the hole, you're dropping decoys down because surgeons are very curious animals. People will drop down random objects in order to attract the fish to come swim into the hole. Today we have a couple of fish-like decoys and a coffee mug. Uh, my uncle swears by a copper jelly roll pan. Um, he's, steer he's speared several sturgeon off of that. So they'll come and they'll swim up to see what it is and then you take a really big spear and then you throw it down and you try to spear the sturgeon and pull it out of the hole. So this is a custom-made sturgeon spear. So this is a five-tine spear. Um, when you throw it, these, these barbs will actually go into the sturgeon and then when you pull it back up, they fan out. So it will keep the, the fish in place. It will detach so the, the handle doesn't get in the way of the fight of the fish, but it stays attached by the rope. And the spearhead stays with the fish and you're fighting it with a rope. <laughs> I've had caviar. I don't know that I've had sturgeon caviar. If I think about my life, and growing up to the point where I'm at in DC at a Michelin 5 restaurant, like Plume, for example. Having the best scallop that I've ever had in my entire life. If you close that off with some sturgeon eggs, I think that that would be pretty amazing to close the loop on just this entire life cycle of harvesting and the culture that I've grown up in and pulling that into a, a really awesome restaurant. I should probably make that a life goal. Today is uh, Sunday, the 23rd, the last day of the season. Uh, the sun's shining, it's making the hole nice and bright so we can see nice. And uh, hopefully we can uh, pull one out of one of these holes. Here we are, what time is it? It's uh, oh, 11.30, we got an hour and a half left. So what I got, 94 and a half hours in so far this year. I did see three fish this year on the camera. So yeah, I'll be putting in a total of 96 hours at one o'clock today. It's been a long season, but we got, they did get a lot of fish. So I'll be looking forward to next year.
and I was able to start spearing when I was 14. Went to church that morning and didn't get out to the shanty till like 10 o'clock. I wasn't sitting in the shanty 10 minutes and a fish came from the upper left hand corner. My spear was on my right side and it came like right underneath my spear. I waited till the head was underneath and I grabbed the spear and threw it. And uh, that was my first fish. I was only 14 then but I drove the truck in, <laughs> threw it on the tailgate. Those days you had to leave the tailgate open. And I lost a fish three different times going in. I was so excited. I had one guy, I was passing, he goes, Sean, your fish is laying way back there. <laughs> I was so excited. No matter if it's your first fish or your 20th fish you speared, every fish is just as exciting as the last one. It's like your first fish every time. No, you got to be dedicated. But there are people that just are lucky. <laughs> and they just go out I had people before that, you know, they just go out, they come out late and get in a shanty and and they spear one right away. Then you got somebody like Mike, my friend, that's been sitting for 17 years and hasn't gotten one yet. All right, I think that's it. We'll try her again next year. It's a good time, always, even if you don't get one. Here we go. Bring the tail up. Yep, bring it right up here. It's gonna fall right in. Hang on to it tight. 105.6 pound fish. Probably gonna be 30 to 40 pounds of eggs in there. Awesome. Consider an ice beard it. <laughs> totally awesome. You better give the fish a kiss too. Like everybody does. All right. We got them all out of there. It's a pail full. What are we doing here today, fellas? Making caviar. We're making caviar. You know, a lot of people, when they think of caviar, they don't think of the Midwest, right? They're thinking about, you know, these high-end restaurants in New York City or LA or San Francisco. Is this something you grew up eating? Yes, since I was a little kid. A baby. A baby. Yep. Yes, <laughs> little, very little. How many fish have you speared yourself out of the lake? Just one. Just Did you kiss it the first time you... you, you yes, yes. Yeah. Did you really? Yes. Yep. On the mouth? No, not on the mouth. Okay. Torb, how many sturgeon have you kissed in your day? I don't know, about 10, I think. About 10, you think. So what am I looking at here? Uh, uh, eggs. The red stuff is the uh, membrane and that holds everything together. So what we're trying to do here is... Uh, get them clean. And we're going to wash them. Okay. We're going to uh, see if we can get that blood out. There's lots. So we're using the Q-tip to pick up the blood, the, yep. the little clots in there? Yep, like these little guys. Yep. How long ago did uh, these egg sacs come out of the fish? About a day ago. How big uh, was the fish that these were pulled from? About 80 pounds. About 80. This is a lot of caviar. Yeah. I mean, I can say as a chef, I usually pay about 120 bucks for a tin this big. And uh, we're talking about two like dish tubs full. Yeah. And it sounds like this isn't even the biggest batch you guys have no. pulled. No, no, not even close. So this for me is completely eye-opening. From a culinary standpoint, you can either get a really fish forward flavor or it can be really, really mild. Uh, a lot of times though, it's very subtle. There's a sensation that happens when you eat caviar, like the popping of the eggs in your mouth. Right? Yep. That's a big part of it. So I want to add it to a dish to just give that little extra burst. Are there any things like in your processing or your experience with processing that makes it more or less fish forward? Um, if you let the eggs sit longer. Uh, that flavor kind of builds? Yeah. These can't be sold, right? Like I can't go to a store and buy Lake Winnebago caviar. No. No? no? It's like, do you give it away to family, friends? Yep. Okay. We put it out at our sturgeon banquet that everyone just goes after it right away. Nice. They love it. How do you actually eat your caviar? When we get done with it, we put it on crackers, which is really good. Norb, how do you take your caviar? I don't. I don't like it. You don't like it? <laughs> so no. how did you get stuck with this job? <laughs> Where is he? Right there. <laughs> The guy yeah. drinking a beer on the side yeah. sticks yeah. you with making the caviar. Yeah. Did you have like an outstanding bar tab or something <laughs> that you were trying to work <laughs> off? And <laughs> You'd almost think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Zach, has Norb been your mentor in this? Like, is he the guy who's oh, teaching yes. you? Oh, yes. Yes. 
What made you decide that it was <laughs> that Zach needed to learn? Because I'm going to quit. And he <laughs> likes it. <laughs> So you said this is from an 80 pound fish. How many pounds of caviar are we talking about here, fellas? I don't know, we're gonna find out. Yeah, okay, so we gotta wait, yep. 19. Look at that thing. <laughs> this is a caviar scale. <laughs> How long you been using this thing? Well, about forever. <laughs> about forever. How do you determine how much salt goes into whatever poundage of caviar. Uh, don't put too much in. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's the most Wisconsin answer I've ever heard. <laughs> don't it. overdo it. No. I like that. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're just, we're putting, we're putting canning salt right now yep. on the eggs. And now you're just gonna get in there and, and mix it up? Yep. Awesome. How do you know when like the caviar is done and ready to eat? Usually we let it sit for about 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Now we're going on break. <laughs> A two beer break, nice. <laughs> the thing that I love about this is it's so down to earth. It's very hands-on. There's not one mechanized step in this process. There's a story of generations in this. This is a tradition. Having uh, kind of the peanut gallery beside us here, uh, drinking beer while all this is going on means that like this is part of the community that's invested in this. Uh, being a chef almost my whole life, you know, learning about caviar as a Midwestern ingredient has never been on the radar. I think that this is so rare to actually see. We've got the box of crackers out, and uh, this is the moment of truth. Show the whole world, Zach, how it's done. Mm. You like it or not? I love it. Really? Yeah, absolutely. It's either you love it or you hate it. No, now I'll tell you what it is that I love about it. It's salty. Mm -hmm. You literally don't get any of the fishiness. There, then you won't get all that salt. I thought you didn't like the caviar. I have to know if it's right. <laughs> He just jams his finger in. Is it right? Yeah, it's right. <laughs> I knew it, man. I thought it was right, but I wasn't sure. Oh no, it's delicious. It's got a lot of earthiness to it, um, but it's really mild and pleasant. Good job. This is a crazy amount of caviar. I mean, like, if you're talking about a two ounce tin that retails for $100, $125 roughly, these are full of these beautiful, beautiful sturgeon eggs. Delicately packed salted, and most of all, made with love. In my family, it's not a party unless there's deviled eggs. So today, we're gonna go through a recipe of putting together some of my favorite Wisconsin ingredients in one little bite. A little bit of Midwestern horseradish to give it a little punch, and I think it perfectly complements some of this beautiful mustard that comes from the Mustard Museum right here in Wisconsin. And we're gonna put all this together with some local eggs, a potato chip that we're gonna fry from scratch. So the star of the show today is this. This is caviar that was harvested from a sturgeon that came in weighing about 80 pounds right out here in the lake. So let's start with the chip. So behind me, I have oil. This is canola oil, nothing really special. And we're gonna heat this to about 350 degrees. Secondarily, to actually make the chip, Here's a little chef life hack. This is a Japanese mandolin that very simply has a razor sharp stainless steel edge right here. And what we're gonna do is actually take the ingredient and moving it down the blade. What that produces for us is a really, really thin chip. We're gonna cut just a few because we'll only need one per deviled egg. Now, once we have this going, it's time to boil some eggs. I can tell how strong your culinary game is from your deviled eggs. If there's any gray on the yolk of the egg, it means you overcooked it. So we really want to prevent that. We want to do like six eggs. One of the hacks that sometimes I will do is actually cook a few extra eggs because I want to make sure I get enough of the yolk filling in order to substantiate being able to fill these back up beautifully. So let's do seven. Now I'm going to turn this up on high and we're gonna bring that to a boil. 
Once it's boiled, I'm gonna put the cover of the pot back on it. I'm gonna kill the heat, and I'm gonna let that sit for seven minutes and 30 seconds. One of the more challenging parts for me when I'm eating deviled eggs is the consistency game. Deviled eggs can be like soft and mushy and you pop that bite in and of course it's delicious, but it doesn't always have that interesting texture that keeps me reaching for more. So that's why we're gonna add the element of the chip. I'm gonna take these, these potatoes here, thinly sliced, and we're gonna carefully drop them into the oil. The reason I wanna add those so carefully, when you have an ingredient like a potato that has a tremendous amount of water encapsulated in the starch, when it hits that hot oil, the initial reaction is gonna be one that's very explosive as it pushes it out of the actual potato. So you can see it's kind of violent in the beginning. These will fry up in a relatively short period of time. So you can go start to finish in about 30 seconds or less. We wanna make sure that we're getting a lovely golden brown on these. And then we're gonna basically drop them into a bowl that's lined with a paper towel to absorb any of the excess oil. We wanna make sure while they're still warm and have a little bit of oil on them, that we season them liberally. Today, I'm using fresh ground sea salt and black pepper, and then a little bit of smoked paprika. I like that element of smokiness on the chip because it gives us another dimension of flavor. That's a good chip. All right, we'll set those aside for now. So we're at the point now where we've boiled the eggs off. They've come to a boil, we've capped them, we've reduced the heat, we have let them sit in that hot water for seven minutes and 30 seconds, and I wanna make sure that I get them cooled right away. We're gonna shock these eggs and fully allowing them to cool in the ice water. Make sure that the internal temperature of the egg cools rapidly as well. This also in this process allows the shells to pull back, making the shells easy to remove. So I have my eggs here. And what I wanna do is be able to cut off the back end of the egg to give us a stable base. Now I'm at the point, the moment of truth as it were, where we open up the egg and we see the inside. And we can see here that there are no tinges of gray on the outside of that egg. That's really important for me. Now that we have the yolks separated from the whites, we're at the point where we actually really get to influence the flavor of the deviled egg. So this is where I wanna start adding my ingredients. I wanna start with mayonnaise because that to me is the hallmark of a really fantastic deviled egg. And I'm gonna go with a couple good tablespoons here. The idea being that you can't really get too creamy when it comes to a deviled egg. I'm gonna season with just a pinch of salt and black pepper, and we're gonna take and bang up the egg yolks. And now, let's go with the, the touch of the horseradish. So horseradish has long been a staple in Midwestern cuisine. It's kind of synonymous with our, our supper club heritage. Now we go with just a little bit of this Wisconsin mustard. This mustard is punchy, and it's got a little bit of a sweet note to it as well. And I like that. I think it adds a little bit of well-roundedness to the deviled eggs, but we just wanna make sure that we correctly balance it with the salt. Let's give the filling a taste. I think it's delicious. You get the richness of the egg, the creaminess of the mayo, the punchiness of the horseradish, and that smooth, sweet finish with the mustard. I like where I'm at. Now for the fun part. For all of the aspiring bakers at home, this is one of the most fun tools to play with. What I wanna do with it is I wanna turn the top collar inside out and I'm gonna put our yolk filling inside. Then we're gonna blow it right into the egg shells, which allows us to basically set the foundation for our deviled eggs. I'm gonna take our knife and score the tip and begin to fill the eggs. We're at the point of finishing these deviled eggs out. I'm gonna gently insert a chip there. So all of this work up to this point has been to create a vehicle for this ingredient. Our wonderful local harvested caviar. Caviar for me is like that luxurious egg yolk. When you order your eggs over easy and you're dipping your toast into it, it has that 
soft, velvety mouthfeel. This is something spectacular. This is something that we're honoring. But most importantly, it's something that we're celebrating. And what I wanna do is just a little chive and use as just a little bit of a garnish. Last but not least, a touch of smoked paprika. I'm so excited about this dish because this is kind of the reimagination of a Midwestern staple. Deviled eggs are something that you'd find at almost any holiday party or celebration. This is the Wisconsin idea going forward, and this is done. The moment of truth. We gotta taste this thing before we put them out. That's an incredible bite. If this came to my family reunion, I'd be excited. I'm not gonna lie. Keep coming, Raj. Let's try to get it more that way. Hold her. Now it's the other way. <laughs> oh, oh. I wonder if we can move it. Oh, it ain't working. Hold it. That's good. Hold her now. Wait. God oh, darn it, it got too far that way again. That's perfect, I think. Let me check the other side, but it should be good. Uh oh. Is it blackberry? Yeah. See, it was worth coming over to cut his hole. <laughs> Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters. The dairy farmers of Wisconsin are proud to underwrite Wisconsin Foodie and remind you that in Wisconsin, we dream in cheese. Just look for our badge. It's on everything we make. At Organic Valley, our cows make milk with just a few simple ingredients. Sun, soil, rain, and grass. And grass. And grass. Yeehaw! Organic Valley grass milk. Organic milk from 100% grass-fed cows. Employee-owned Nugler's Brewing Company has been brewing and bottling beer for their friends, only in Wisconsin, since 1993. Just a short drive from Madison, come visit Swiss Wisconsin and see where your beer is made. Wisconsin's great outdoors has something for everyone. Come for the adventure, stay for the memories. Go wild in Wisconsin. To build your adventure, visit dnr.wi.gov. From production to processing, right down to our plates, there are over 15,000 employers in Wisconsin with career opportunities to fulfill your dreams and feed the world. Hungry for more? Shape your career with these companies and others at fabwisconsin.com. With additional support coming from The Conscious Carnivore, from local animal sourcing to on-site high-quality butchering and packaging, The Conscious Carnivore can ensure organically raised, grass-fed, and healthy meats through its small group of local farmers. The Conscious Carnivore, know your farmer, love your butcher. Additional support coming from the Barocco Food Co-op, Central Wisconsin Craft Collective, Something Special from Wisconsin, Crossroads Collective, the La Crosse Distilling Company, as well as the Friends of PBS Wisconsin.